let's give it a second. It's, it hasn't seemed like it's done it with Zoom, but with Teams, when I would record, it cut off like the first 10, 15 seconds, and I got stung a couple of times. Okay. Where I'd start off like kind of wacky. So, yeah, no worries. Okay. So I'll just jump right in. And, and what I figured we would do is uh, I would just, you know, kind of introduce you, then I'll have you introduce yourself and give a little background information. Okay. Is that fair? Okay. Sounds so, good. Right. Well, welcome to another episode of the IT Woodworker. I am Chris Kusilis, your host, and I'm joined with Paul Boyd. Paul, good afternoon. Thanks for for uh, for joining today. I appreciate it. Hey, Chris. Thanks for uh, having me on your your podcast today. Appreciate sure, it. Sure, sure. You bet. And Paul Paul is an is an engineer. He's a senior engineer with Nutanix. Paul and I work together. So, in full disclosure, we're both Nutanix employees. And Paul, if you could you know, just kind of start out and talk a little bit about your background. How did, how did you get into it? How did you become an engineer and you know, how long you've been at Nutanix, that kind of thing. That'd be great. Yeah, sure. So I, I have a finance degree from the university of Illinois. So you can see naturally how that fits into uh, an it career. So I, yeah. uh, I don't do much finance anymore other than uh, it does. It actually all joking. I was going to say joking. Uh, I use it to balance my checkbook, but uh, the finance does come in uh, handy on, on, on some, you know, cloud economics. And when you're comparing, you know, doing some TCO analysis, so it does help with the job. But all that said, uh, I became, I slipped into IT through the back door, as most people did in the 1990s. You don't go to school to be a system administrator. Uh, you go to school, become a developer, which is usually more than half math. Uh, so they don't, there's really no, uh, at least Back in the 90s, there wasn't a way to you know, train to become a, a Unix system administrator, right? So I, I worked at a trading firm in the back office in, in Chicago, trading futures and options. And uh, there was an opening in the IT department. And I saw coming from the back office, th th those people in IT seemed to be having a lot of fun and making a lot more money than me. Uh, and I just kind of naturally had a, a grew up with computers and stuff. So I slipped in and became a system administrator for, for Unix and then storage and at, at various IT firms and hedge funds in the Chicago area. Uh, and then I slipped to the dark side in about 2004, I, I or excuse me, in 2008, I, I worked for NetApp. I went over and started selling uh, IT to, uh, to people that I knew and, and other customers. And so that was a change for me, obviously. And, and, um, uh, so I, I worked six years at NetApp selling NAS storage and some block storage, which I think we're going to talk about today. Uh, and then in 2014, uh, I heard about this through some people that worked here. I heard about this new exciting startup called Nutanix. And I said, what, what's Nutanix? And it's hyperconverged. I don't even think the name hyperconverged. It was distributed. I think it was called hyperconverged storage back then. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I said, well, you know, give me the 30 second sales pitch. What does that mean? And, and basically the people that I knew who worked here said, you, you take your, your storage that you've been tra traditionally selling over at NetApp and, and EMC and, and big refrigerator sized boxes full of disk drives and you throw it away and you put those disk drives back inside the servers, sort of like they were in 1991 when I started. <laughs> And, and I said, well, that sounds like you're taking a step backwards. And they're like, well, yeah. So now you've got rid of your sand and your sand fabric and all that complexity. The, the storage is inside each host now, like 1992. But what they didn't have back in 1992 was software, a software defined storage, a distributed file system, a way through software to take those disk drives scattered throughout all the hosts in the entire cluster and pool them all into one big storage pool that's shareable by the entire clusters. That's what hyperconverged in a hyperconverged uh, infrastructure and a distributed storage file system did for us starting in, in well, I started I started with Nutanix in 2014. Uh, the company actually started in 20, 2009, uh, so I, I was still kind of in the early stages and. Uh, uh, that was that was Nutanix version 1.0 was basically eliminating the three tier architecture and uh, servers, switches and SAN and combining it all in the one box. And then through our software, uh, you know, creating a cluster with a, a, a shared pool of storage that in a nutshell is what we did. And Paul, you've just encapsulated everything I wanted to talk about on the show. So, hey, thanks. And, <laughs> and join us next week when we go over something yeah. else. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So no, so that's great, and thanks for that. Um, what's interesting is I have seen a lot of finance people actually in in the IT world, and the thing that was kind of uh, uh, telling to me, and maybe just a little bit, um, was more of a surprise than than finance people in the in the. IT world were musicians. And I don't know if, if you've noticed that, but there's a, there's a large contingency of people who are just musically uh, enabled be, because it is, and I always thought of music as an art, but music is, it's really about numbers and being methodical on the things you do and being really precise. So finance and musicians are, are the people who run the IT world. Yeah, there's a lot of math in music. Uh, my yeah. daughter is a musician, so I, I get to hear that a lot. And but it, it could also it could be because it's math related and logical, like you said, but it also could just be a release from, uh, you know, the day to day. Yes. Get, yeah. Getting <laughs> yeah. away from your computer, enjoying something else in life and expanding your horizon. So I think there's maybe a little bit of both of that, you know. True. True. Well, excellent. Well, thanks for that background there, Paul. And and what we're going to what we're going to talk today about is is really the storage aspect of Nutanix and hyperconverged infrastructure here. Because when I think about storage and you know I've I've been, you know, I've been in, in the this form of IT for about 11 years. I was in IT kind of roughly another 10 years before that though. But storage was always that, you know, I, I remember somebody telling me 15 years ago, hey, if you want to make money, sell storage, because that's where it's at, because it's it's big dollar ticket, big ticket items. And 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 we talk about eliminating silos. And and even in storage, there's there seems to be multiple silos in themselves. And if if you could talk maybe a little bit about that, because you know, quite honestly to me, you know, you get the files, you get the objects, um, you get all kinds of different storage. And there's specific vendors who sell just that and they do a really great job of it. But Nutanix has really converged that into one platform. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, all throughout uh, history uh, from the 90s, I should say, uh, there's been, you know, people that preferred local disk drives back then and then people that SANS were new and SANS talk block storage. So you provision LUNs and you talk LUNs and, and, uh, and then, and then a company called NetApp started up in the mid 1994, 1993, and they they kind of brought NAS storage to the front, network attached storage, which was which has been around for a while. So, in other words, you could map a drive from your Windows box to a Windows server. That's that's an example of NAS storage. Or you can take a Linux box and do an NFS mount to a, an NFS server. That's NAS storage, and that's what. NetApp really excelled at for years, and they still do. Um, uh, and now, uh, you know, I think the, I don't want to say it's recent, I don't even know how long it's been out, but object storage has been around now for at least a decade. When I was at NetApp, we were, they were getting into it at the end there, they had acquired a company for, for object storage. And, and that, I think I, I pretty much all of them talk this, the industry standard S3 protocol. So rather than block, Rather than one of the NAS protocols, uh, they talk S3, which is a way to uh, put and get and uh, copy data within an, an object uh, file system. It's not even a file system, but an object storage. Uh, mm -hmm. And so those those have been around for a while. There's been it's almost uh, I don't want to say yeah, sort of religious, but it's been kind of a religious camp. But now I think. There's no, I don't know if there's a battle anymore between, you know, hey, this is run this database on NAS versus run this database on block. I, I think that's kind of fallen by the wayside. And I think people are choosing the right storage technology or the right storage protocol to meet their needs. And it seems like, um, it seems like uh, uh, object storage again. And, and and even some file systems are are getting pretty large these days with unstructured data. So unstructured data is another way to say uh, like data that's not in a database. So unstructured data seems to be exploding. You see all those stats by in three years, there's going to be more data photos and all these things taken than ever before in the history of data. You know, so I, you know, unstructured data is ex exploding. How do you manage it? And I think usually like an object storage solution is, is the way to go. Um, and so to give you an example with Nutanix, uh, we started off with, uh, you know, I, I mentioned Nutanix 1.0 was el eliminating your SAN and, and eliminating the three-tier storage. 
and uh, placing VMs on top of a hypervisor. Uh, and so while those VMs that, you know, that they, they talk block to the, the hypervisor and the hypervisor fools the VM into thinking that they're talking to some block storage or some, the C drive on a windows VM running on Nutanix AHV, for example, is actually talking block to some, uh, some underlying storage device. But in reality, the, the hypervisor is fooling the VM. The hypervisor is taking those, those IOs from coming from the VM and writing it down to an underlying storage system, in this case, Nutanix. And in the case of AHV, AHV, the actual hypervisor, which sits between the VMs and the Nutanix distributed file storage file system, it talks iSCSI to, the, to Nutanix. So even though the hypervisor is a Nutanix hypervisor, and even though it sits on uh, top of our own distributed file system, we've chosen to cho uh, chosen a, an industry standard protocol, iSCSI, to talk mm -hmm. between our hypervisor uh, and the underlying storage. In, in the case, if you're running ESX on Nutanix, you're talking NFS, which is a NAS protocol. So it's, it's a good example of choosing the right protocol that suits, in this case, the hypervisor, what makes the most sense for the hypervisor for those VMs. Um, now, if you take it to Nutanix, maybe 2.0, um, we, you know, we, we started with hosting VMs and, and doing VDI in bulk on Nutanix. Uh, well, and, that, and that's files, right? Is that files that was originally? But, no, no, because that that hadn't come yet. So okay. uh, VMs is just uh, you know you're running on top of a hypervisor. The VM thinks it's talking uh, NTFS to its C drive. It doesn't know any better. It doesn't know that it's talk. It's actually a virtualized uh, VM running on top of a hypervisor. The hypervisor is then talking iSCSI or NFS, or in the case of Hyper-V, it was talking SMB to the underlying Nutanix file system. Um, take it to the next step now. And I think the next protocol we started supporting was uh, block. So or, or okay. Nutanix calls volumes. So if, if you, uh, in other words, instead of, ho in addition, I should say, to hosting VMs on a Nutanix cluster, the Nutanix cluster can be an iSCSI target for your block storage needs. For So for example, if you do have a physical database or a physical SQL server or something that you just can't virtualize yet for whatever reason, and you want to keep it physical, a physical host, you can still take advantage of the goodness of the Nutanix file system. And just through, you know, a Windows iSCSI driver on that, on that, on that SQL host, point iSCSI, that the iSCSI client driver to the Nutanix storage, which talks iSCSI, and we can present block storage to your physical host. So, uh, gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, I think then the next protocol that came along was files. Um, okay. So in, in that case, I think we started off with uh, SIFs or SMB. In other words, window. We started being in Windows. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, you have your Windows laptop. Instead, you know, like at the previous example, I said you could talk iSCSI through block device to a Nutanix cluster. Well, now with a Windows laptop or a Windows server, you can map a drive through SMB to a Nutanix cluster as well. And files then grew through the years and we added NFS, NFS3, NFS4. And so, and then we sh start sharing between the two. So we, in other words, we're, we can, we have all the feature functionality. I don't say all, we have most of the feature functionality of, a, of your typical NetApp cluster that's been in the business for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And we've done it in five, five or six years or so. Uh, so we can be an NFS server and we can share data between your Windows clients and your Unix or Linux clients as well. Uh, so that's that's VMs. So we talk VMs, we talk iSCSI volumes, block, we talk NAS files, both SMB and NFS, and share between the two. And then what else? Oh, objects. Yeah. So objects, I think, might be the newest uh, protocol. Uh, so if you have the need for a S3 object uh, compliant cluster in your data center, uh, you can point, uh, Nutanix speaks S3, industry standard S3, which I think is actually Google. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, or, or maybe it's, I'm sorry, Amazon, Amazon, AWS. 
Uh, so we, we can be your on-prem federated object cluster uh, for your object data uh, on-prem. So uh, VMs, block, NAS, objects. I feel like I'm forgetting something. I'm just we looking do, uh, at Kubernetes. Here. We do Kubernetes. Okay. Kubernetes is the latest thing. Uh, Carbon uh, is our own flavor of Kubernetes. Uh, uh, you know, white glove uh, for those of you that want to get into or stand up a Kubernetes cluster quick and dirty. Uh, Carbon is a white glove chauffeured way, limousine way to do that quickly. Uh, but we also support uh, 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 Red Hat uh, OpenShift as well for a more enterprise grade Kubernetes uh, environment. So we can be the, we, we can host your Kubernetes servers. Uh, we can host your uh, K8 applications, your, your cloud uh, native applications as well as through the goodness of our file system, present uh, persistent storage um, to those applications um, as they as they as they go through their life cycle. And and the real the magic behind this is it's all on one platform. It's all managed from one console. You you don't have disparate technologies that you know, obviously they've been working for the last 25 years, but you could have separate teams that are managing them, separate ways to connect them. There's more challenges and, and you know, possibilities for failure in between them. With Nutanix, it's one platform. You can utilize all of it on it. Is that is that an accurate statement? Correct. So everything is that I just talked about is uh, managed through our management plane, which is Prism. So, um, if you've been around a while, it's pr also known as Prism Central. Uh, but Prism Central has all of these uh, management planes built in into it. I hate the term; it's a single pane of glass, but or a manager of managers. But that's exactly what it is. And and but it, yeah, I think even more important than um, uh, uh, you know uh, being able to manage everything I talked about in one management plane is being able to give permissions to developers or your DevOps team in the case of Kubernetes, you can delegate appropriate per permissions through Prism Central uh, to these other teams in your environment, if you're the IT admin. There's always, so today the conflict between IT administrators and the DevOps teams, there's always been a conflict between IT admins and developers or DB admins. So Prism Central, not only does it give the IT administrator a single point to manage everything from the in the Nutanix cluster and do all kinds of day two operations non-disruptively, but it also allows that IT administrator to delegate to the DevOps team, hey, you have permissions now through OpenShift, for example, to spin up your own apps and to set policies for replication or data protection on your own apps and containers, right? Mm -hmm. You can delegate to the to a development team, hey, you've got resources now. You don't have to call me and ask for a virtual machine, through, which I can delegate manually through Prism. But you, you can automate you automate that them yourselves, or you can do it yourself. Um, and so that's pretty powerful, is to kind of uh, give. The, I don't. I, you're never going to get the developers and the dev, DevOps team to go to the same bar and have have cocktails with the IT administrator. But <laughs> but you can allow them to work efficiently together. Uh, and Prism Central uh, allows you uh, allows you to do that. So you eliminate the silos there. You actually reduce some of the the burden put on the storage team, and you you're you're more quickly being able to have the developers get what they need to do their jobs and be more efficient and innovative. Yeah, if the developers uh, don't have to call you to provision a VM, they can do it themselves, either log into Prism or through an API. Everything I mentioned in Prism Central is all API driven. Mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty powerful. That allows them to develop yeah. apps faster, get them out to market faster, beat the competition to the street. Same thing with a DevOps team. You know, you know, if you're developing next generation apps in Kubernetes, everything can be done as code in Nutanix. Uh, you can, you know, uh, right. Uh, I'm going to, now this is a religious, I'm going to use a term here that is a religious war, uh, cube CTL or cube cuddle or cube control, depending on how you say it, I don't want to offend anybody, but you can code this all into your Kubernetes, uh, administration and, uh, uh, and everything can be as code spinning up, uh, containers and, and setting data protection policies and replicating and cloning and all that. 
So setting persistent storage. So uh, we're not eliminating silos, silos, I think, we're, but we're eliminating friction between the silos. Right? Okay. And then, you know, falling back on your, your uh, finance major here, um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, projecting or forecasting the growth you need and how, how you can do that with the Nutanix platform too. So you're not caught off guard and you don't have to go to the CFO and say, Hey, we, we underestimated, we need a whole other storage shelf. We need a whole other array. Right. No, good question. So Again, built into Prism Central uh, are some more advanced uh, forecasting and uh, techniques. So, uh, you know, you could have a, a project, like I mentioned, that you've delegated to uh, to developers. Uh, you could have a you can group all your VMs or containers by category, and then run reports on these categories to see usage reports and things like that. Uh, but then you can also uh, run reports on these categories or projects or how, whatever makes sense to your business, however you got things categorized, you can run reports to see, okay, based on the run rate uh, from the past six months or whatever, whatever the look back period is, uh, you can forecast ahead, hey, I'm going to run out of storage runway in 92 days before I run out of or it looks like if given current trends, and, and this just isn't drawing a line between a bunch of dots. Nutanix uses a bunch of machine learning to look back and see trends in CPU, RAM, and, and disk, and all the resources in your project. And it you know normalizes blips or ups and downs and, and one-time events, but it, it gives you a, really, a confidence window and a projection. Like, hey, I'm going to need to buy something in you know 76 days or whatever the time frame is and then you can say well given my cluster has eight hosts in it and they're and there's 76 percent utilized cpu today and you're telling me in in 76 days it's going to be 95 percent utilized well what do i need to buy and it'll actually tell you it'll make a recommendation hey on these eight nodes or whatever you have you, you need to add another two nodes of this type with this CPU and this RAM and uh, tell your sales team and tell them what you need, basic, basically. So it, it gives you some pretty good projections on what you need uh, for the end user to at least give budgetary estimates to the CFO of what's what's coming. Um, and you'll, you're not going to max out an array, so you have to buy a new array. That's not the way that Nutanix scales, right? So maybe you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so in I came from a storage background, like I mentioned, and, and uh, it's probably the one area in life where it, nothing good happens when you hit 100%. So you always want to avoid 100% utilization. I'm going to tell my boss that and say, <laughs> hey, boss, Paul told me I don't have to hit 100%. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, sales quotas is a different thing. Uh, <laughs> storage utilization, never you want to, you don't even want to come close to 100%. Uh, same thing with Nutanix and with the tools built into uh, Prism Central and the runway projections, uh, we we help you av avoid that at all costs. And and there's other ways too to to look at projections to avoid. You know, we give you a lot of tools to avoid hitting 100. percent And one other thing about cost projections uh, in Prism Central, uh, we've extended this now. I, I the example I gave was like your typical eight node on-prem cluster or 16 node on-prem, whatever. But you can now also through some advanced modules in, in Prism Central, uh, formerly known as Beam, you can do cost governance based on your clouds. Um, so Beam can actually, um, and, and Beam now is, is delivered as a service from, uh, from our own uh, website. Mm -hmm. um, so you would point like your AWS uh, public cloud uh, or your uh, Prism Central on-prem Nutanix cloud, you can point them at Prism Central, or excuse me, at Beam, or which is now called Nutanix Cloud Manager Cost Governments, running as a SaaS service in the cloud. And it'll look at all the data and all the, uh, the resources in your public clouds and as well as your private cloud. And it'll tell you how much things are costing you, uh, whether there's wastage, uh, whether their things could potentially be cheaper if you run them elsewhere. Uh, so that's uh, like the, that's the next level, uh, the pro level of uh, cost governments built into, uh, I say it, it's built in the Prism Central, but in, in this case, we took it out of Prism Central and made it its own uh, service. 
and it's it's not a tool that just that you know it's not a a Google tool or it's not an AWS tool or it's not an Azure tool that could be slated in one direction. It, it, it's a conglomeration or it's agnostic. So it can look at it wherever you've got it and it can, it makes the recommendations. It doesn't care what the recommendation is. It just makes the best recommendation. Correct. It's a multi-cloud governance tool uh, and it compares and well, it shows you costs of your environment running, whether it's on-prem Nutanix on AHV, our own hypervisor, on-prem Nutanix running ESX hypervisor, or AWS, or Azure. And I'm not sure if GCP is there yet, but it's probably coming. But so it's cloud agnostic, and it gives you, uh, uh, you know, the cost, what your run rate is in all these clouds, as well as uh, recommendations for how to make things more efficient. Uh, whether, you know, hey, I, I'm paying for this extra large VM in AWS, but it's not using those resources, I could probably downsize or I don't need this much IO. Uh, mm -hmm. It makes all, of, or maybe it's, you know, may, maybe it's running all the time. And if it makes sense to you and your business, it might make sense to bring that VM on-prem. It might be cheaper to run sure. that on-prem. Yeah, so. Sure. Good. Well, that, that's good stuff. Now talk to me, because this all sounds really complicated. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, deploying it, deploying it, upgrading it, patching it before you do that though i'm going to run and pull my ribs off and throw them on and then i'll just splice the tape right here give me one second <laughs> all right sounds good yeah All right. So hopefully I'm not out of breath. <laughs> um, we're we're probably coming up on like 30 minutes here too. So okay, is this is this a good point after you talk about that we wrap it up too? Because sure. I like to try to keep it around 30. Yeah. So a, um I'll be brief on this. Yeah. No, you can jump, you can take as long as you want. I just didn't know if we want to go into another topic if that would take it. So we'll it's up um, to you, whatever you want to do. And then you can edit it if you want. It's up to you. Yeah. Why don't you go through this deployment piece of it right there, and then we'll kind of end it right there, and then we'll okay. hang around a little bit and figure out what the next, what we want to talk about next. But go ahead, and you can start explaining. Yeah, so for, I, I love to tell you that Nutanix uh, deploys itself, but uh, although it is super easy to deploy, uh, I rec highly recommend our professional services. Uh, they can help you deploy uh, you know, a single node cluster all the way up to a 32 node cluster, and it's the process is basically the same. Um, and yeah, we do have customers then that after the first few deployments, you know, they they've learned enough and they can do it themselves, and that's fine. But I definitely recommend Nutanix deployment services. And then with some of the software, I talked about Prism Central. Or there is, I definitely recommend Nutanix. You know, some workshops uh, just so you get the best value out of those tools. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a lot in there. Uh, they're not hard to use, but there's just so much in there. It's good to have somebody that knows walk you through and say, this is good and, and have a tailor for your environment and show you how to do all this stuff. Um, and then uh, for day two operations, uh, everything I talked about on a Nutanix cluster, whether it's on-prem or 
it's in a public cloud. So we do have Nutanix clusters running in the public cloud. They're, they're called NC2 clusters or Nutanix cloud clusters. Uh, so you run the, and it's all managed through the same prism, by the way. So you can have a Nutanix cloud cluster in AWS or Azure today, and GCP is coming. Um, and the experience and all everything is the same as running a Nutanix cluster on-prem, except you get bare metal from a Azure or, or uh, AWS instead of procuring your own hardware on-prem. But um, all the day two operations can be done through Prism uh, and you know, from the lowest level disk firmware upgrade all the way up through upgrading the hypervisor. So that entire stack is managed by Nutanix and Nutanix support also for day two operations and help is always there. They're the best in the business. Uh, our support is fantastic and, and they have to be, right? They have to manage mm -hmm. that whole stack from the lowest disk all the way up through the hypervisor. And in some cases they go higher than that into the networking stack and things like that. We get calls a lot of times for networking problems or or VMware Broadcom problems be, just because the, the customer doesn't want to wait for Broadcom to get back hmm. to answer an ESX question. <laughs> so uh, so that, that's what I wrote uh, for our, our uh, deployment as well as uh, day two operations. And you know, patching just like the rest of the stack, it's it's been designed to be done with zero downtime. Yeah, patching can be done uh, with uh, zero downtime. Uh, obviously, if you're patching the hypervisor on a 16 node cluster, we we roll through one node at a time. We V motion or or live migrate, depending on what hypervisor you're using. Live migrate the VMs off to one of the other hosts in the cluster reboot and patch the host in question. When it comes back online, we move things back and move on to the next one. Um, and then just to give you an idea of deployment, we used to say, uh, even me as an as an SE doing like a proof of concept years ago, I used to tell customers if we come on site, we can do a proof of concept, get it installed in the morning and we can have a nice long lunch, come back, it'll be done and we'll go to happy hour. And, and usually that's, <laughs> that's how it worked out. And, and it's still the case, I think, you know, but we usually allow another day just for cleanup and documentation. But the one other example I wanted to give you is our clusters in, in AWS, for example, uh, we call them NC2, Nutanix Cloud Cluster. So you can provision bare metal through your own AWS account, get bare metal uh, hardware uh, through AWS, and then you install our hypervisor on those bare metal nodes. And, and then you have a Nutanix Cloud Cluster. Uh, that takes also a uh, very, you know, a couple of hours to get all that set up. Uh, and then uh, then you can grow it, right? So we have customers running, you know, this is an example of a day two operation. Uh, if you're running like a pilot-like cluster, of a th we, in this example was a three node pilot-like cluster in AWS, and it was re replicate, it's a, it was the DR cluster, right? They were using mm -hmm. it for DR. So they're replicating all their VMs from a large cluster, a 28 node cluster on-prem, to this little three node cluster in the in AWS. Uh, it's just a big enough to store all the data, uh, but then they, they they did a DR test and to expand that three node cluster to a 28 node cluster fully functional and running in AWS, stop, start to stop took a little under five hours. So mm -hmm. with five hours, uh, and now it's even less time than that because we made some improvements, but, and, and you didn't have, they didn't even wait till the end, they, one, you know, it, it, it within a few minutes it was a four node cluster and then a five node cluster and a six node, and, and they started to spin up vms as soon as they could and then at the end it was a 28 node cluster that mimicked the size of on-prem so that's just kind of the the times we're talking about here how to to deploy and expand these things that that brings another question to mind that i know i only had that one last question for but i have another one now okay so with all the simplicity here and with all the speed here do you uh what does security look like? I mean, to, I mean, because you know, as I hear all these great things, it's like, if there's, is there a trade-off? Uh, no. So uh, it, it, Nutanix has been security conscious since I started. And in fact, I was stunned when I came on board in 2014 to learn that our biggest customers were in the federal government because we were so secure. We had such an emphasis on security. Uh, we we lock down our hypervisor. Uh, we we lock down our our controller virtual machines, which run on top of our hypervisor. Uh, we have Stigs, and we we have all these Department of Defense certifications. So our, our clusters themselves are hardened uh, to the max. And, and then you can even 
uh, go through a procedure to lock it down even further to Department of Defense standards. Mm -hmm. But then outside of that, which everybody's concerned about today, are malware, ransomware, uh, and uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, Micro-segmentation. I was thinking multi. Micro-segmentation. So within a Nutanix cluster, whether it's on-prem or an NC2 cluster, an AWS or Azure, uh, you can uh, lock these, you know, we have we have uh, ransomware protection and, and immutable snapshots built into our NAS service, for example. And then you could use, we have multi uh, uh, micro segmentation built into the product itself. Uh, and it's called Flow, F-L-O-W. So you can set policies, again, through Prism Central. Flow is built into Prism Central. Uh, you Through Prism Central, you can set policies based on categories or individual VMs or containers. Hmm. And it says basically, do not allow or, or allow this group or individual VMs to talk to this group or individual VMs. To, so you can lock things down between VMs even within a Nutanix cluster. Uh, so, and that's a native, that's a native Nutanix technology. And so I have some, is this familiar to like a, 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 a tetration or something for segment? Uh, yeah, it would be equivalent to like a, if you, for those of you that know of VMware, uh, would be equivalent to like an NSX, NSXT, for example, okay. except without all, it's built in. It's not an add-on bolt-on product. You don't need a separate infrastructure for it. Uh, That's what I was wondering. <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, it's built in. It, it's managed through Prism Central, but it's actually built into our AHV hypervisor. So if you're running ESX on Nutanix, you still got to use NSXT, unfortunately. Uh, but if you're running Nutanix native hypervisor, which is AHV, which most of our population does these days, uh, it's built in. It, it's built into Open vSwitch within a, the AHV hypervisor. So is it fair to say? that because we've really collapsed the infrastructure storage switching you know servers down and we made it a simpler process here that it's it's just more secure because it's really it really and you think about that one throat to choke in it and it here i mean everything i mean we're not pointing fingers on everything and we've built it in from the ground up so it's not bolt on it's built in correct i would say uh it's it's more secure because it's you know it's one pro it's one product but there are still multiple layers of security built into Nutanix which every good security uh, administrator wants to see so we we pass all the security scans but even beyond that we have many layers of security built in Nutanix all managed through the same Prism management plane. Gotcha. Well, thank you. This has been extremely helpful. Is there any? Is there anything I didn't ask, Paul, that I should have asked around storage? <laughs> around storage? No, well, I know I... we. I know we've got some more topics to tackle. I just know we can't tackle them all today. Um, but is there anything around storage that I that I maybe I didn't tackle that you wanted to point out, or do we get a pretty good picture of uh, from a high level view? I think you covered it all. I, th I mean, the one last thing I want to finish with is, you know, in the early days, we used to joke like we would put the storage admins out of the job. Yeah, that, that's not the case, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, you know, so pe people used to get defensive, you know, Nutanix would come in and, hey, you know, they're, they're talking about replacing my job, you know, and that that's not the case, right? So, uh, you know, but we have simplified the process. We have uh, allowed those storage admins or even the hypervisor admins to up level their game so they can move into more uh, lucrative fields, more interesting fields, new fields for a change of pace, such as security management or container management or replication and DR or uh, NAS, you know. So there are, uh, you know, uh, uh, other paths and other, uh, uh, we're just, we're, we eliminated the mundane so that you mm -hmm. can focus on more relevant things more money making things for the business and provide more value to the business that's what we do and and we've given them their nights and weekends back with with the the patching as well so you can have a better quality of life yes absolutely i you know customer i have is like i mentioned they have 24 and 26 and 28 no clusters and uh, they roll through a patching cycle in, in a weekend uh not a problem yeah yeah, yeah. excellent excellent and they, they don't have to sit there and watch it right you know they get to do yeah. other 
right? It, it'll tell you if something goes wrong, right? So nice. Well, Paul, again, this was helpful. I appreciate it. I can't, uh, I can't, I look forward and I can't wait to have you on the next one. We'll have to come up with something interesting to talk about, which I know won't, will not be a challenge for you. So, uh, hey, Paul, thanks for, for being a part of it. And we'll talk to you soon. Have a good afternoon. Hey, thanks, Chris. Thanks for happy, ha having me. Yeah, have a great rest of your day. Yeah. Thanks. Let me just and stop. <laughs> Sorry, did I talk too much? I'm sorry. No, no, you were fine. You you went a little technically deep, which is that's okay. Um, 